All right, it's noon, and I know we're st still waiting for a few more people to log in, but I know Milo has a jam-packed presentation for us, and of course, we want to leave time for Q&A. So we're going to go ahead and start the webinar. Um, first of all, let me say good afternoon and good morning to everyone. Uh, this is Gatwiri Muthara, Membership and Communications Manager for Compto National, and we'd like to welcome you to our emotional intelligence and sense-making during a crisis. And everyone can agree that we're definitely in trying times right now. So this is very useful information. So we have a few housekeeping rules before we begin. One, please mute your phone or your computer audio so that we're better, a better, better able to hear the host and the presenter. If you are experiencing any technical difficulties, send a chat message to the host. Um, and if you have any questions that you'd like to submit for Q&A, send a chat message to everyone. Just a reminder, this call is being recorded and will be made available on Compto's YouTube channel. And we'll send an email out um, after the webinar with that recording. And once again, we'd like to thank you for joining us. And I will now hand it over to Milo Thomas. Milo, thank you. Happy Thursday, folks. Um, I look forward to um, actually getting a chance to execute this webinar. This is a very uh, passionate topic for me. Uh, it's one of my... Um, uh, master's thesis and moving my doctoral thesis focus on uh, strategic leadership. Um, so these things are super important and there are things that are adopted by major business leaders all around the world. I'm currently employed at Avail Technologies, which is a transit um, technology company. I'm director of customer experience. And so that's my relationship with public transit uh, currently. So I was invited to come through via Foothill Transit a while, a while ago. And so that's how I actually got involved in, in, in Compto. Uh, so we'll go ahead and get started here. Um, this, just some learned outcomes. I really want to be able to show the inseparable union between emotional intelligence, emotional intelligence, and system making during the crisis. Um, and it's just something to think for, think about in the back of our minds when we go through this. We won't deep dive uh, in, in full totality into both subjects. Uh, simply based on the depth, but we'll go deep enough for you to understand the concept. Um, and so hopefully you can have some practicals you can take away. Um, so I like giving some practicals off right away, um, which is really important. Um, this is your problem the moment you hear about it. It's really important. Uh, trying to delay or not respond because you don't want to own the problem in a crisis uh, leads to career political uh, suicide. Uh, own the crisis or it will own you. It is very important to have that perspective. And know that every decision that you have will be uh, scrutinized. You know, trust me, people do not want to lead during a crisis or anything difficult. Uh, it's much easier to lead when things are going well, we're smiling, their money's coming in, our KPIs are nice. Uh, but during times of crisis difficulty, uh, people, people don't want your job. So if you're leading during that time, uh, it's a reason that you're there. And so, um, and just take pride in that. Uh, that bullet that's in the fire is really important that you're able to maintain your composure and things like that. That's when the emotional intelligence comes into play. Um, then uh, stand by a clear set of values and make them known. I think it's very important because during a crisis, as you make decisions, uh, you want to be able to publish your values so people can understand why you're making your decisions. A great example of that is our governor here in P, uh, PA. I thought he did a great job. I didn't agree with what he was doing, but I knew the values he was standing by, so I had to respect them. Um, and so that's very important to let your values be known because so people can align your decision making with your values. And that last bullet can be hard, you know, speak the truth regardless because uh, during a crisis, uh, we, don't, we don't know the outcome. We don't know what will come about. And so often the decisions that we make don't yield the results that we desire, but it's always important to always be truthful during that time. So when we get into a crisis, uh, there's, there typically is a major shift, and that's from management to leadership, right? And so I want to be able to, to lay these out. There are many different philosophies that align with the two. Um, this is kind of the one that I lean towards. I'm not saying that this is the gospel, but I view uh, management as a push you kind of pushing people to, uh, to to execute a process as efficiently as possible. Uh, when I talk about leadership, I'm thinking of a pull where I'm pulling people to change the direction uh, that they're currently in or the current um, goals that they have. 
So then we'll keep that in mind because often in the crisis, there are often uh, pivots and changes. I want to highlight managers here. Uh, so managers are people who do things right. So, you know, in, a, in, in our transportation, we're often operational gurus. We want to manage uh, uh, things as efficiently as possible. So we do process efficiency and mitigation. One way or another, we're trying to accomplish those things, right? We, we, we kind of interject innovation, but in, in, in very small increments. We're not trying to change the world. Our goal is often to streamline things with minimal change so we can maximize results. Often in the crisis, you have to switch to switch to, to, to becoming a leader. And the leader is a person who does the right thing. You have an idea. The idea is often different than what you're used to executing to. You perform what I like to call micro experiments and you take the organization in a new direction. So keep that pivot in mind as we talk about uh, a crisis because we go from management to, to leadership often that takes place. And some of us are in positions where we just manage and don't lead per se. And so often a crisis often highlights the need to pivot our thinking process. So we're going to go into emotional intelligence, right? The concept of emotional intelligence is when emotions rise, you know, uh, our intelligence should rise with them. <laughs> often when our emotions rise, um, our intelligence doesn't uh, rise with them. And that kind of leads to uh, the, the, the uh, damage that can be caused when, when we're not in control or recognize how we're impacting people, a situation, or ourselves. So in doing that, uh, Goldman is he's my favorite uh, emotional intelligence scholar. So I often use his structure because he focuses on some components that I think are extremely important for the individual and then the group. Um, he has a concept of recognition and regulation and self and other. That first one, self-awareness, is making sure you're aware of yourself you give yourself an accurate assessment uh, so you can understand where you are. That's very important. The next one is self-management. He talks about, hey, you have to be able to manage yourself, manage your emotions, uh, so you can uh, perform best and be able to optimize your situation. And after that, there's a social awareness to say, hey, you know, now that I, now that I have some awareness, I have some management, now I can start to apply my emotional intelligence to the things going on around me. Then lastly, he says, hey, now we can begin to manage relationships uh, because we are, we, we've had a building block up to this point that sets us up for victory in that area. But here's a critical aspect of this. Uh, these must occur in order. And at that top level, number five, team leadership, that's the level that that's the level that sense making takes place. So if you're involved in one, two, three, and four, you haven't quite brought yourself to be at level five, you have a problem doing sense making. Um, and leading during a crisis. Now, you're not performing those previous bullets or those prerequisites perfectly, but you're aware of them and you're, and you're kind of executing within those parameters and that framework. So I'm gonna dig into these individually so we can get some concept of what they're about. You know, self-control is being able to avoid emotional breakdown. And so psychologists like to call an emotional breakdown any involuntary reaction to a situation. So it's not someone freaking out and need to be putting a paddy wagon and putting a white suit, but it's any involuntary reaction you have to something. And if you think about that definition, uh, we have a lot of those, uh, more so than we're aware of. And so consequently enough, uh, and the uh, data is pretty sufficient, new, with uh, scientists uh, say that the way to avoid an emotional breakdown is really not feel like you have to defend yourself because it's a primitive Neurological, it's a primitive neurological reaction we have that causes us to, to naturally defend ourselves, which can lead to an emotional breakdown. That's what I like to call counterintuitive uh, to what we're used to. Um, and the next concept is when you have an emotional breakdown, regardless of it, as if you feel the results or not, it has an impact. And this really points towards our senior leaders, right? Because if I'm in a senior management position, if I decide that I'm going to freak out on my staff, something's going wrong, I may not feel the consequences of that because I'm in charge, but the goals I'm trying to achieve feel the consequences, and my staff does as well. And that last one, the concept of stinking thinking. And this is negative mind racing. And whether you admit to it or not, you, you've had situations where your mind begins to race upon negative thoughts of what you think will happen and what you would do when those negative, thing negative things take place. And they control our emotions and how we feel. 
So we, so we want to be able to avoid stinking thinking. Self-managing. So, hey, now I know what's going on with myself. I was honest with myself, and I want to be able to manage, right? Uh, Self-control is a key aspect of this. Um, it is important for everyone. Uh, being able to remain composed despite your emotional state. One of the interesting things about emotions in general is people assume that because I don't feel the emotion, that means I'm managing it. That's actually false. True uh, self-control is I feel the emotion, but the emotion does not dictate my behavior. I just recognize that what's place makes, makes me feel a certain way. Um, and this is not faking a smile. This is just taking the emotion you're feeling and processing it. Self-control of all emotions. And without self-control, you're easily manipulated. You know, I don't know how many of you guys have been in emotional meetings. You may see this when you're senior staff meetings. Uh, once someone is set off, they're easy to control. Um, and, you, and you do not want to be that person that's easily manipulated. Social awareness. Talk about empathy here, right? And I'll, and I'll, I'll just get to the first slide. I'm going to go into the other one. You can look at that, some things that help you with your empathetic listening. But social awareness is challenging when we have a self-orientation. What does that mean? We orient other people's behaviors towards what we think it should be. For example, I'll use myself. I'm a martial artist. I believe discipline should be a certain way. I have a certain focus. Everybody has to think and have my orientation. If that's the case, I'll have a hard time working with different types of people, with different type of personality types and things of that nature. If I have a results-first attitude or believe I'm the smartest person in the room, that really impacts my social awareness and my ability to work and be around other people. And so those are some things that we want to avoid. And I have some tips there to help you with your empathetic listening on the other side. Relationship management. Uh, now, uh, Victor Franco, he's a, uh, he's a scholar, he's dead, but he was a concentration camp survivor. And he talks about your mind being the last of human freedoms. And that's how he was able to survive concentration, concentration camps, because regardless of what they did to his body, they, they could not control what was going on between his ears. And he has this concept of giving people a reputation to look up to. Um, me, and he said that because your perception of a person becomes your reality of that person. And if we give people a reputation to live up to, we're giving them the opportunity to succeed and be great in our eyes. It's very important uh, when you're in a leadership and management role. I want to highlight a few of these things here. Uh, the first one is maintain your center at all times, regardless of what you're feeling. What does that mean? I'm a martial artist, so one thing I try to do is I try to get people off balance so I can, so I can manipulate them. Whether I bump them, I kick them, I get them backstepping or sidestepping, I do that on purpose because it's hard for them to attack or strike from a, from a place where they're not centered and balanced. And the same thing for emotional intelligence. You have to maintain your center and not let your emotions be swayed by your environment because if you do, you won't be able to execute your best. Now understand that, you know, in, in dealing with people is not a zero sum game. What do I mean by that? In order for me to, in order for me to get what I want, the other person cannot get what they want. So we get caught in this back and forth because we don't understand. We think the other person has to lose in order for me to win, and that's false. So we have to break that mentality. Now, the last one I want to highlight is focus on your goal. And I will give you, I will, I will give an example of this. My family, we're huge Star Wars fans. So we're watching some cartoons, some Clone Wars, and my daughter wanted to pick the next episode. So we said, yeah, she was super excited about picking the next episode. The, the, the remote control happened to be by my wife. So my wife was going to just say, hey, what episode do you want? My daughter gets an attitude because she wants the controller. <laughs> Now she misses out on her goal because all of a sudden she's emotionally connected to the remote control and the power of having the control versus her ultimate goal, which was watching the episode that she wanted to watch. I know that's a, that's a simple example, but it's to give you a mental uh, image of, uh, of the way losing focus on your goal can really cause you to stumble uh, when it comes to EI. And what's really important here is to understand where you fall in a sequence. Where do you land? And you have to follow the, prere the prerequisites for this, because if you do not, you tend to be someone who 
is either wear socially or you have an emperor's new clothes, you believe you're performing at a certain level and you are not. And so the difficult aspect of this is knowing where you land so that you can in turn be able to put yourself in a position of growth. And that's the concept of EI. Very simple, very high level, but if you can master those things and put those things into practice, uh, you can begin to master your um, master your emotions and not let your emotions master you. And after we lay that foundation, we get into sense making. And I have sense making here because it's not so common sense. Because a lot of these things seem practical, and most people don't practice. <laughs> uh, and so sense making, this would be a very practical uh, 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 presentation with this, but is something that is not practiced because it's not so common sense. And there's a definition of sense making, right? I'll give you guys an idea. Uh, Carl Wick is one of the original scholars of it. He's very known. And sense makers enable leaders to have a better grasp of what's going on in their environments, right? Such helping you facilitate proper activities. And when dealing with a crisis, that's super important. Why sense making? Well, he, Equivocality, which basically means the unknown. There's so many results that you can't control. Constraints, real and rational, right? Hey, financial, lack of information, time, cognitive ability, you know, truly identifying the problem. Confirmation bias, right? What's confirmation bias? That's the tendency for me to interpret the evidence to back my own beliefs versus what's really going on. And selective bias, right? That's the same reason why when you watch an election, uh, all parties involved can have a positive metric to support their point of view because they're looking for data to support their point of view versus having an accurate sample size. These are things that make sense making so important because these are things that lead to a disaster uh, during a crisis. And what's the basic premise here? <laughs> when, when confronted with crisis or equivocality or complex situations, we tend to use our cognitive bias and our contextual clues uh, to make sense of what's going on. And we often act on it. And the sense making basically basically resolves this, right? So we'll get into the seven steps of sense making so we can get an idea of, of what this is as interpreted by Dr. Wick. The first one is seek out many types of data, both qualitative and quantitative. This is really important. You know, and this is where KPI is coming to play. Hey, what impacts your industry? But here's, here's the thing, during a crisis, do your KPIs even matter, <laughs> right? Because they matter during standard operations. During a, during a crisis, do they even matter? And that's an important decision to make. And you know, your technology should be able to give you the data that you want. But if, you're, if your technology wasn't giving you the data before a crisis, it will not give you the technology during a crisis, right? And we want to talk about um, the qualitative side of it, you know? Um, if you're in public transportation, you often, you know, it's a business of the heart. So raw data often can't be used to make decisions and really get a solid understanding of what's going on with the whole team, ground level, personal interviews. All those things are really important. Seeking out the, the various myriad types of data really is a great, a great uh, foundation for you to be successful with sense making. The other aspect is sense making is a team sport. And this is a strong EI component, right? Your mental models can only get better when you receive input. But as a leader, are you ready for the challenge of people giving you input? And as leaders, some of us have to take a corrective action because we've been so obstinate in the past of receiving input that during a crisis, our people don't want to tell us that we're doing wrong. <laughs> and that leads us to even more disaster. And so we have to really think about that. Move beyond stereotype, super important. Try to understand the unique details of each situation. And this is where your life experience or your seniority can really be a problem for you. Uh, when we talk about stereotypes, you really want to think of the concept of automatic processing. And that's when you rely on your default schema to do things. What is a schema? Your schema is your cognitive structure for processing information. Our beliefs, how we grew up, the things that we learned, they often are, are they make up our schema. In our, in, in our mind, we're cognitive misers. We want decisions to be simple and quick because we've learned how to do things. But when you layer stress, fear, pressure on top, automatic processing takes over, which, is, which causes a problem because in a crisis, you need to think outside the box, right? And so 
The cost of missteps because you're stereotyping and, and you're using automatic processing can be critical. So, uh, leaning on your experience is a weakness and can be a weakness in a crisis, but more importantly, your experience doesn't do you harm, but your process of knowing when I have to jump outside my experience to look for something different is what can harm you. So you, you know the emotions that trigger your automatic processing so you can leave all things open to bear. And this was critical during COVID-19. When things were going on, trying to make decisions, things were changing. Um, in the micro, constantly getting our leadership team to think outside of the box. We can't do things the same way. So we were putting unnecessary limitations on ourselves and we were making decisions based on how we thought things should work based upon what we believed. The EI comes into play here because fundamental beliefs or practices are often challenged. This other one here, be very sensitive to operations. And this is another challenge point because operations as standard will likely have to change. And so there are four things I'd like to talk about here or highlight, look out. What's going on around you? Because a lot of times we are stuck in our organization processes and our organizational optimization. During a crisis, we need to look out and see, hey, what is, what's going on outside of uh, the box we're in? Look around. I mean, what are people doing around me? What's going on in the regions around me? And when I figure out what's going on, look in the mirror. Am I ready for this? What do I have to do to change my perspective in order to lead my team? And then, then I look at my team and I say, hey, guys, we have to be ready to do this. What skills do we need? What modifications do we need to have in play in order to change our operations? Because right now we're moving very cognizant as if, as if a crisis wasn't taking place and it's causing us damage. This is, no, this is a very important one here. Do not simply overlay your current existing framework on a new situation. So system making is often been likened to um, cryptography. What does that mean? Our mind, we frame stuff based on how we think things should go, our experience. You call it a map, story, experience, framework, either, either one of those things people, people call them. Doing sense making, uh, which is triggered, what should be triggered during a crisis, which, 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 which you want to trigger during a crisis is the following. I build new frameworks based on modified short amounts of data. So let's say I only know what's going on between now and the end of the week. I built my framework or my map based on that. So let's go with COVID-19. Stuff was changing weekly, sometimes daily. So my organization, we had to reframe every two to three days. And then we went to weekly. And then eventually we went out to bi-weekly. And it was very hard for the organization to get management team on board to understand that, constantly reframing uh, so we can adjust ourselves so that our friend could properly support the current data or the current situation. And once you have your framework, put your, put your situation into the framework. Oh man, it's COVID-19, this is what we can and we cannot do, because this is what the CDC said, let's build our framework based on this. Drop our situation into that framework, let's make those decisions. Oh, something has changed, our framework is modified. Drop our situation into that framework. So we were modifying our framework every week, every five days or so, but dropping our situation in that framework. And here's the challenging part. Once I have my situation, I drop my situation into the framework. Now I'm performing micro experiments. See, people experience situations or they learn from situations by acting in them. So during a crisis, we can't be scared and make mistakes, but we want to minimize them. So we do micro experiments, small experiments we can learn from so we can build off of. We try something, we get that result, we measure, and we try again with the old data as a reference. This is super important for us to be able to build things out and make decisions. Um, think of it now. Some of us is how do, how do we get people back to work? How will social distancing impact vehicles? How will social impact uh, social distancing impact the way we have to operate our business? Um, how will social distancing impact revenue or funding? All those particular types of things. Super important. Micro experience, micro experiments will get you there. If you make a, a, a large swooping decision that you expect to last, it's probably going to fail you somewhere along the way. So we make micro, we do micro experiments, we make small changes as we build out our solution. So in sense making, you'll often have multiple iterations through steps five through seven 
as you uh, build out and learn more information through your crisis. And so those are the seven steps of sense making and how we overlay them over. I do have something I want to point out here and I call these my Jedi tricks or my Jedi tips. That's the concept of locus of control. I'm going to let you read internal, which is where you want to be. External is where a lot of people often lie. We attribute our success um, to luck or fate. Uh, we, we don't attribute our, 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 our failure, failure or our success to our own efforts. We believe there's some external power. Uh, often we believe that no, there's no power to overcome a situation. We often focus on what's fair and we trim the, and, and that type of personality tends to stress a lot. And so there's nothing fair about a crisis. If you're in leadership and you're in a role and a crisis takes place, there's nothing fair about it. But let's look at this. Two people, one with an internal locus of control and one with an external locus of control, will execute the same kind of plan with the exact same results. But here's what your constituents will think. Here's what the people who follow you will think. If you're internal, hey, that, that person took the bull by the horns. They did their best. They may have failed, but they took ownership. A person with external locus of control, success or fail, you know, that person never took ownership. They got lucky. Along the way, they were blaming stuff on everyone else. They were making excuses, you know, uh, and that person wasn't strong enough for that situation. <laughs> and that's that's two people with two different locuses of control with the exact same results. Uh, that's how they will be viewed by their constituents. And this is why CEOs often get rehired for more money after they have epic fails. You know, if you watch the business world, Someone will have an epic fail at company A and get hired for more money at company B because success or fail wasn't really the thing. It's, did that person take ownership of what needs to be done? That's the type of person we want on our team. And that's why you see that CEO cycle take place. Some tips to help you um, if you have an external local, local external locus of control, excuse me, lean towards the internal locus of control. Focus on what you can control. Very important. Uh, if you're stressing out because things look out of hand, focus on what you can control. Turn criticism into growth. When you're, you, when you're leading during a crisis, the criticism is coming. It's coming hard. Turn it into growth. Find the nuggets you need to propel yourself forward and seek support. It's a team game. So in closing, you know, I'll, I'm hoping you got a, a, ch a chance to see the marriage between uh, sense making and emotional intelligence and how they're really inseparable. And I, and I say here just in crisis, but I think in general, uh, it's hard to separate one from the other um, in order to be successful. Um, for EI, you have to honor the sequence and the correctness. If you do not, you will be walking around like an emperor's new clothes, believing you're something that you are not. You know, cultivate emotional intelligence and sense making so you can be prepared for the moment. And then also cultivate it with your team so they can be prepared for the moment. And learn to have an internal locus of control. That's very, very important to have so that you can take ownership of the situation. And here's some references from some scholars I'll use and I'll place this here, mainly so I won't get sued. And I'll give some of my mentors their props as well for um, some people who coach me and teach me uh, on this topic. So that's all that I, that's all um, I have. Are there any questions? Hi everyone. This is Gatwiri again from Compto National. Um, if you have any questions, please type them in the chat and send to everyone. Um, so feel free to anything that's on your mind about the content. Please uh, share it with us. And while we're waiting for any questions, um, while um, once this is over, a follow-up email with a link to the recording and a post-event survey will be emailed to you. And we'd like to remind you of our upcoming events tomorrow, June 5th, Friday, June 5th at 2 o'clock p.m. Eastern time. We're going to have a Compto Town Hall and Race, which will be moderated by our national chair, our national board chair, Freddie Fuller, as well as our CEO, Brad Mim. So please join in, it's um, from two to four Eastern time. And then we also have on June 11th, our top three biggest career derailers 
derailers for professionals of color and how to overcome them. This will be a recording that will be made available for several days. Um, and this is by Deborah Owens, and she gave a presentation last week, which is excellent. So I'm going to stop right there and let's see, do we have any questions in the chat? Um, would anyone like to speak up? We can also do that as well. Milo, did you want to touch on anything else while we wait to see if there are any questions? Um, did you have any, I guess, other thoughts? Uh, pro tips, yeah, I'll call them. Uh, I'll call them pro tips. There's a there's a concept uh, called the change style indicator. Um, it's called it's a mother tongue of communication, and uh, you don't you want to ask questions. Just write this down. Change style indicator. What it is is it identifies how people communicate, what people view of people who have the different uh, communication style. For example. Uh, the concepts are con conserver, pragmatist, and originator. And in those personality types, if you don't respect a person's position or understand where they're coming from, you often get clashes. And research has shown is that leads to the derailing of most teams, not because teams can't work together, but because they have preset notions of what to expect and or receive from teammates and they're not able to process them properly. So um, that's a uh, free tip if you are researching these things. And you want to be able to grow your ability to manage up and manage your team and be able to lead people to success and actually uh, help your managers, people who manage you be successful. I think change style indicators are a great way to be able to do that, especially when you're dealing with people in the senior leadership process. Okay. Well, it looks like we have one question from Dante Floyd, Flood. <laughs> what are the byproducts of mastering emotional intelligence and how can we apply this with regard to the consequences of COVID-19 and the recent protests? Ah, that's a lot. <laughs> um, so the emotional intelligence allows you to be able to take advantage of your full cognitive ability because you're able to think about how you need to respond and process. And that's simple, but understand the concept of thinking yourself. Um, it's always the joke that someone gets into a, uh, it's hard to remember what has happened when you're upset or you're angry. Um, and from a business perspective in COVID-19, having EI to not freak out emotionally and think through things is really important. We live in an information age and where things are so false. Facebook, Twitter, everything. People put out clickbait to jar us emotionally just for propaganda purposes. And as leaders in business and industry, we have to be able to make wise decisions uh, on that. And a lot of times we can't be reactors of information, but uh, people throw that bait out there for us to react. And so that's how that it helps us with COVID-19 to really think about how we need to do it because the, the, the perpetrator of fear caused a lot of problems, but also the perpetrator of ignorance as well. You know, uh, people thinking because they're young, they won't die. So they go all go to spring break in Florida and then a lot of them get sick and almost pass. Um, not thinking about true information because uh, you get political perspectives, you get data perspectives, and they use the drawing of your emotions to actually um, convince you that one's better than the other. Emotional intelligence helps guide you through that. Concerning the protest, I think it's the same thing, thinking about how we want to respond. What do we want our long-term goals to be? Um, I was on the phone with some of my clients uh, in, in various cities, and uh, and they were telling me that, uh, you know, uh, the protesters were being edged on by anarchist groups that have been identified who are bringing bricks and starting riots by breaking windows and things like that to get people riled up. That's what people are doing. That's not sense making. That's not emotional intelligence. We're, we're allowing other groups to manipulate us, right, in, in order to do things. So as you can see, uh, the mob is easily moved, and we can be easily moved. We don't take when we don't take the opportunity to uh, use emotional intelligence and sense making in a proper way. Okay, we have uh, two more questions. One is from Donovan. He says, "How do you balance emotional intelligence and being passionate for a topic, role, or situation?" Ah, that's a great. That's a great question. Um, I think that's. I think you do that by focusing on the goal. Uh, and a lot of times our goal 
necessarily doesn't align with our path. And so that's the first thing I look at. Um, because a lot of times I believe that, you know, my path leads to the goal. My path may not re lead to the goal. And what I found in my own experience is my passion a lot of times is focused on the path and not the goal. And you can kind of see that even as we look at some of our civil unrest now, um, the path there seems to be the argument and people are missing the goal. Uh, and I think if you can align that, you can allow yourself to be successful. But also, using your emotional intelligence uh, and your sense making, and, and the last component I talked about but didn't discuss, change style indicators, you can convince people uh, that, that, that you have passion for this and for a reason. And avoid making it personal, make it data driven, and then you can also lean on the emotion of the other person to see what you can do to get them passionate about your topic. But the moment that you're defensive, protective, you lose your audience. Okay, I have one more question. I heard someone talking in the background. Was that someone with a question? Okay, so we'll take this question from Tara. How can we apply these techniques to our personal life? Ah, yeah. So. That's free. That's a that's a free gift for marriage counseling and relationship counseling when it comes to emotional intelligence. That's a free gift that actually comes with this. Um, and to be honest with you, from a personal relationship perspective, a person who is your spouse or a significant other, uh, you do more damage to them from a relationship perspective than you do any other person. And it's simply because you're around them the most. It's not a matter of uh, uh, some uh, evil or anything like that. It's a matter of proximity. <laughs> and so I strongly encourage you to practice these things at home and it'll make it easier for you to do them at work. How do you apply them? I think you apply them by first letting the person you're working with know that you're trying to improve in these areas and make it a joint venture. Um, because uh, if you don't, uh, people can start to assume that you're self-righteous uh, uh, and things of that particular nature. And so from a relationship perspective, a personal life perspective, I believe if you do that, it'll help. Now, let's just say it's me as an individual and I just want to become a better person. I start aligning these things and thinking about things in all my interactions, focusing on self. Um, how am I feeling? What causes me to react? What, what causes my emotions to flare? Being able to list all those things and then ask the question, why? And once you ask the question, why? Begin to interpret what you need to do in order for those things not to happen. Because what we tend to do as humans is we, we need to, if someone's swinging the bat, we assume we have to meet the bat with force in order to stop the bat. I can simply step aside and let the bat pass me by. And that's the concept we want to do when we get engaged in EI in our personal lives uh, and, 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 and see these things become more, uh, that's the way we become more proficient. Because if you practice in your personal life, it'll be easier at work and professionally. That's a great question, by the way. Okay, thank you, Milo. It appears like, it appears as if we have no other questions, so we'll end a little early. So once again, um, I'll reiterate that we'll have a follow-up email with a link to the recording and a post-event survey email to everyone. And once again, tomorrow we have an important event, our Compto Town Hall on Race, which will be Friday, June 5th from 2 to 4. Um, please look out for the registration link. Um, we were having some problems, but we're sending out a new link so that everyone will be able to participate. So thank you once again, Milo, and thank you everyone for attending. Have a great day and enjoy the rest of the week. Thank you.